The issue is not that he likes a man. The issue is that he likes a bald man. Today I'm going to be talking about the first six books that I read for the year of 2022. That means I'll also be doing giveaway for all of these six books plus five brand new books from Book of the Month because they are the sponsor of today's video. Do you know what Book of the Month is? Yeah. Do you remember the ad read? <clears throat> Alright, do Ready? it. Book of the Month is a super fast and popular online growing book service for readers whose mission is to promote new and emerging authors. Mm. Book of the Month is a super popular and fast-growing <laughs> online service for readers. Their mission is no, to no, promote- No, 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 hey, I wanna do hey, it. No, <laughs> I wanna do it. I wanna prove to them that I know their service better than you do. Book of the Month is a super popular and fast-growing online service for readers. Their mission is to promote new and emerging authors so that readers can discover new books that they love. So every month, they curate hundreds of titles and pick the five best new ones for readers, and you can choose which one to be delivered to your door. It is totally risk-free, so you can skip any month, any time, and you would not be charged. Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah, see, see, good. Mm -hmm, exactly. <laughs> and that's why it's more important that you use my code, Read with Cindy, to get your box for $9.99. I actually started Don't Cry For Me last night. It's a book about a father who's dying of cancer and he's writing a series of letters to his gay son. I'm like 50 pages in so far, it's really good. Giveaway details will be in the description if you wanna check out all the other books that they have available. But if you want the books guaranteed, you can go ahead and sign up for your first box using my code read with Cindy for $9.99. Now that I've proven that I'm clearly the superior book of the month sponsor, let's go ahead and talk about the books that I read. I do want to say right off the bat though, I rated pretty much all of them three stars except for the last book that I read, which was the Office of Historical Corrections. If you've been watching my channel for a while, this should come as no surprise because I basically rate most of the books that I read as three stars. This brings me to a question, which is, should I continue rating books on a one to five star level. I feel like it almost simplifies your thoughts on books and it just makes people think, oh, she must have hated it. Or if she read a four star or five star book, that means it was objectively good. Plus, I recently found out that apparently if you rate a book three stars, it can ruffle some people's feathers. Last year, I found out an author whose book I rated three stars blocked me, even though I had talked positively about their book and didn't even tag them in my review. So they were looking for it and saw it and I guess got upset by it. It's just kind of awkward. Like I don't want authors to feel bad just because some random loser on the internet fell in the middle about their book. So let me know if you think that I should just ditch the whole rating system and just talk about the books or maybe adopt a different rating system. Maybe something different will cover more nuance or at the very least make sure that an author doesn't have a mental breakdown every time a random person thinks their book is just okay. Let me know what you think is best. Otherwise, I'm just going to continue as I have been. Let's dive into the books. The first book that I read this year was Fiona and Jane. This is a short story collection following the lives of two Taiwanese American women across two decades as they navigate friendship, sexuality, identity, heartbreak, all the good kind of shit that you deal with in your 20s and 30s. In the first story that you read, one of the main characters finds out that her father is gay and actually has another lover on the side, but he had to give up that relationship and go for this more traditional family and give birth to her and be married to his wife instead. So right off the bat, I'm like, oh my God, we're revealing this juicy shit right away? I was just surprised because I feel like it's so rare to see older generations of Asians even acknowledge queer identities, both in books and in real life. This is definitely what I was most interested in reading more about, but because the book is more of a slice of life kind of style, you're not exactly following a narrative thread. You're just getting these glimpses throughout the lives of these people. So you don't really get to see like the drama or the the fallout of anything. Something to also note is that despite the title and the cover and the synopsis of the book, it doesn't really focus that much on friendship. It's really more focused on two individuals. Their lives are barely intertwined. It's even mentioned at some point that they don't really talk to each other that much. Despite them being best friends when they were younger, they kind of grow apart later as adults. I kind of feel like that's a shame because I wish we got to see more of them connect. However, the book does work in giving a lonely feeling as you cover these two two 
individuals, which I think is accurate to how it can be when you're an adult. I found myself questioning a lot of the choices that the author made to construct the story together. These stories are put together non-chronologically, so you might be in one part of their life, but then you jump backwards a couple years back. And it gets kind of confusing because you're already following two completely separated individuals. And it felt like I was unnecessarily putting together a puzzle that didn't have any purpose for it being a puzzle. I also wish there was more of a plot or a narrative thread, but I think you can argue that maybe the author was really trying to go for what real life is like. And in reality, you don't really have a plot. You don't have much closure. You don't get any resolutions. You don't even remember things in order chronologically. But does that work for a book? One character is also told in first person perspective. The other is told in third person. I didn't understand why they were told differently. So it really just felt like there was a disconnect between these two women. We actually read more about their relationships with other men than with each other. So again, I would have wanted to see them connecting each other and how they impact each other's lives. Even if they don't talk to each other anymore, at least give me something to root for their friendship. Otherwise, why don't we just focus on one character the entire time? Why does it have to be Fiona and Jane? That's why I was kind of like in the middle with it. The next book that I read was a novella called A Spindle Splinter. This follows a girl who has a rare condition where the few other people who have the same condition as her do not live past the age of 21. So because she's known that she's gonna die at a certain age, that makes her really attached to the fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty. On her 21st birthday, which is also meant to be her last, her best friend throws her a Sleeping Beauty themed party. There's literally a tower and a spinning wheel and everything. She picks her finger on a spindle and somehow that ends up transporting her into a fantasy world where she gets to meet a Sleeping Beauty who is dealing with the same fate as her. There's definitely a strong parallel to the main character's chronic illness and Sleeping Beauty's curse to sleep forever. I like that there was that similarity of feeling like you're cursed that way, of having a limited mortality. And there's also this theme of the passivity that comes with feeling like you have a short life and not feeling like you have much agency to control your fate. People often view Sleeping Beauty as the least feminist Disney princess because she doesn't do much in her own story. So I like that this book shines a spotlight on the princess and another girl who in the modern day world feels similarly to that. The themes of this novella are very clear in showing the fragility of their lives and how they decide to fight against their fate and take charge of their own stories. I did find that the writing is a bit too simplistic and juvenile for my taste though. It reads a lot like middle grade even though it's definitely not because it references weed and suicide. So there's definitely dark elements to it but the writing gets a little too juvenile for me that it makes it hard for me to take the messaging seriously. If I could compare the tone of this novella to any other media, it would be Shrek. It was constantly referencing pop culture. It was breaking the fourth wall in a cheeky way. It was talking about fairy tales in a very meta way and also explicitly talking about subverting the tropes. So it's very on the nose with the messaging and it might be too meta for my taste in a way that feels like it's more cheesy than clever. For example, there are literally lines where the characters say, I hope you find your happily ever after. Or they say, I'm just looking for a better once upon a time. And it just gave me the ick. That's just not my thing. But if you're looking for a light read with tongue in cheek writing, then you might like this book better than I did. The next book that I read is A Touch of Jen. And did I only pick up this book because the cover shows a chick showing off her underwear? Yes, because I'm a pervert. I have been eyeing this book for a while because other than the ass cheeks, the synopsis did sound like it would be interesting. It's basically about two unhappy losers who obsess over some random girl online. And I was like, oh, so it's like book Twitter. The two main characters are a couple who are miserable in their lives. But the thing that they do share is an obsession over Jen, who is the guy's ex coworker. Their entire relationship revolves around fantasies of this girl. They'll constantly stalk her Instagram. They'll memorize her captions. They have notifications on whenever she makes a new post. They even act her out in the bedroom. Like the girlfriend will literally pretend to be Jen and the guy will go along with it. The plot begins when they actually run into Jen in real life and she invites them to go on a trip with her boyfriend and her group of friends and that's how they get integrated into her social circle. For the majority of the book you basically get to read Insufferable Millennials but then later on the book turns into a weird direction 
version where it becomes more of a psychedelic horror. This is where it kind of lost me because in the beginning, there was a clear social commentary on parasocial relationships and the kind of miserable people who cyber stalk and obsess over others. But once it dives into the horror part, it becomes a little bit too convoluted for me. I start to question what the point of this is and what the messaging is trying to be. Maybe I'm just not smart enough for it, but maybe also I don't care enough to understand it. But as a result, it doesn't feel like it hit the nail for me, whether it's a modern day social commentary or whether it's a horror story. It kind of just is in the middle. But the author was definitely trying to be experimental and avant-garde and weird. And I can commend her for being a little bit outside the box. However, I will say that if you are into indie movies where the characters are purposely annoying and are caricatures and it's basically like millennial commentary, you would probably be into this book. But I feel like it could be weirder. Like if you're gonna go down that route, you might as well go all the way. Make them really obsessive and creepy. That way we can have a little bit of fun. Speaking of weird books, the next book that I read is What Big Teeth. This is a young adult novel about a girl who returns home to her family of werewolves after years of estrangement. They had kicked her out of the house a while back and sent her to a boarding school and she never knew why. Because of that, she's felt like she was basically ostracized. And even though she's moving back in, she still feels like she isn't truly a part of the family. Because while her other siblings and her parents and grandparents can turn into wolves, she cannot. So it's kind of like furry in Kanto. The writing definitely has a unique quality. You can really feel the gothic atmosphere and that some shit was not right. My favorite part ended up being near the climax where one of the characters opens up their mouth so wide that you can see all their teeth and you get swallowed whole. And it was just described in a very grotesque way. So it is a spooky little story that I think has interesting ideas, but I think it lacked a lot of direction and plots because so much of the story ends up centered around this weird bald motherfucker in the book. He is the family accountant. He's always there eating dinner. Well, he's not really eating dinner. Everyone's eating, but he's just like there. And usually you would be like, yo, why aren't you eating dinner? You're being kind of weird. Also, why are you so damn cold and pale? But with this family, everyone seems to be in love with him. The main character, her sister, her brother, and some other relatives, even if they don't explicitly say they're in love with him, they still have this weird ass attraction to him. There's no way everyone in this family is simping for this bald ass motherfucker. You're done. You're all done. That was the biggest mystery throughout the whole book. Why does he have such a chokehold on all these furries? Is he that great of an accountant? How much money is he really saving them and all those taxes for them to be up his ass? Somehow he has the Pete Davidson effect because everybody wants to get in his pants. There's the part where the grandma shames the main character's brother for being in love with him and saying that's not natural and trying to set him up with girls instead because it's really weird that he's sipping over the accountant. And I'm like, really? That's the issue that you have? have in your weird ass furry family. The issue is not that he likes a man. The issue is that he likes a bald man. You're just too blinded by your homophobia to realize that your accountant literally looks like a fucking bowling ball. I don't give a shit what gender you're into, but I'll be damned if you ever thirst for a baldy. To any of my viewers who are bald, I'm just kidding. I just want to give the accountant a hard time. Honestly, you could probably rock a bald look better than I could. I just don't understand why everybody's sipping for this guy. Now there does end up being an explanation as we dive even deeper into the bald man's background story. But at that point, the story has been so up the ass of this random character that I wonder, what about like literally the main character who's on the book cover? The plot ended up being so overly dependent for this guy that I feel like we lost any development that we could have had with the main character or her family. I also question why was she the main character in the first place? She was so passive the whole time. She didn't serve much to the narrative. Imagine you have your own story, you're on the cover and everything, and instead the spotlight ends up on a bald dude that everybody's thirsting over. That's just embarrassing. It would serve better if maybe we had a different main character to follow that was more active. Otherwise, I'm gonna wonder, why is this girl here? She's very pretty, but what purpose is she serving? Speaking of finding a purpose, the next book that I read is Find Your Artistic Voice. This is a guide to help you along the process of your artistic self-discovery. And this is only meant for visual artists. So people who do paintings or sculptures or graphic design. Developing an artistic voice 
voice is important because it's what makes your work stand out and uniquely you. The main takeaways are actually pretty simple. The book advises you to one, show up because it's not enough that you just have ideas in your head. You actually got to show up and do it. Two, make art every day. You have to keep on practicing and be diligent. Three, practice what you want to be good at. And four, give your fears a big bear hug. And so what she means by that is to just face it head on. If things get hard, you shouldn't stop. You should keep on going, knowing that this is very much part of the artistic process. The book is not life-changing, but I do think it helped give me a boost of inspiration. Even though I'm not currently focusing on graphic design, I am very much in the headspace of wanting to continue writing and working on my novel. It's not a visual art, but it is some kind of art anyway. And what I did take from it is that if I want to be a better writer, and most importantly, if I want to get this goddamn novel done, I really do need to work on it every day. This is advice that might make other writers cringe, but I think it's very important for me to do so because it's the only way that I can get better. It also makes me feel better when the advice is to keep on going even when it gets hard. I feel like so much of advice is more centered around self-care and getting some rest and stopping whenever you're tired. And there is validity in that advice, but the thing is I'm a lazy bitch and I overthink things. And if I stop whenever I'm tired or if I'm sick of it, I'm never gonna get anything done. I feel better knowing that me feeling tired or being stuck at some point is normal and part of the process. She also talked about embracing the monotony of work as well. And again, that makes me feel better because I find that a lot of the work that I do, whether it's writing or graphic design or art is very monotonous. And it makes me wonder like, oh my God, am I not meant to do this or whatever? But knowing that it is part of the process just normalizes it. It doesn't make me feel like, oh, I'm not doing this right. I appreciated having interviews of other artists because it did give a diverse variety of people, not just in the medium that they do art in, but also in their sexuality and race. What I do wish we had more of was in-depth interviews because a lot of their advice kind of blurred together. It was very similar to one another, which is ironic because the book is about distinguishing your artistic voice. I also wish that we had examples of their art because it just gave a bio of what they do and where they've been featured in. I had to look up their artwork on their Instagram in order to connect their art to the kind of answers that they were giving. And the book could have just saved me all the work by presenting it that way. Basically, the book wasn't groundbreaking, but it did give me a little boost in creativity and remind me to keep on working on what I'm working on. And then the last book that I read that I rated four stars is The Office of Historical Corrections. The title is a novella, but the book is filled with other short stories to accompany it. The themes around these stories focus on race and culture and history. So for example, the title novella is about a government department where workers will go around correcting things that are historically inaccurate. So for example, if there's a plaque at a museum that has the wrong year, the worker will write a little citation and put it as a sticker on there so that they know to correct it. The main character used to be a history teacher before working here. Something that they often call her to do though is to often correct this other woman in the department who has been making a fuss. For example, example, this woman would disrupt field trips that kids would go on by saying, actually, George Washington was not that great of a person. He would rape and enslave tons of people, which kind of brings the mood down when the kids are supposed to learn about how heroic these colonizers are. She'll also go to memorial sites and add to the labels there because she believes that it's not just important to list the names of the people who have died, but also to list the names of the people who have killed them. So again, it gets really awkward. The department actually ended up firing her about a year ago, but she's still going around doing this shit. So they bring in the main character to help try to reel her in. The main character actually has known that other woman since they were little, because sometimes they would end up being the only two black women in the class. So they were often kind of melded together, but obviously the other woman was much more vocal about things. And the main character is just trying to do her job. I loved the whole premise of the story. And I think it really goes to show how this author crafts all the other short stories. She's very purposeful with the way that she puts together these narratives. Another story that I really liked is called Boys Go to Jupiter. This is about a white woman who gets in trouble at her university because there's a photo of her in a Confederate bikini. It gets posted online and it gets tons of backlash. But while you deal with her dealing with the tensions between her and the other students on campus, you also read more of her background story and the way that she grew up, including growing up with a black 
family that she was really close to, almost like a second family. I thought that juxtaposition was so interesting because you get this background story of what she's been through, especially dealing with certain losses in her life, at the same time that you're also seeing how she's complicit in racism. And this is something that I really want when I read a story, especially if it deals with racism. I feel like it's so easy to just make stories where characters are just racist bigots and that's it and there's nothing more to them. And the book doesn't even do it in a way that provides sympathy for this character either. It just helps further inform you of this character. I wish more books were like that. People who are not just caricatures of what we think a racist or a bigot is, but a fully fleshed out human being who is also doing some stupid ass shit. <laughs> I typically rate short story collections three stars because it's hard for me to consistently enjoy all the short stories, but this is a collection that made me reread some of the stories because her writing is so good. It's very sharp and to the point. It packs a punch. It's not trying to overdress with any purple prose. It's very purposeful. She was able to say a lot with very little. So that wraps up all the books that I read in the month of January. Again, I will be giving out all these books away, so the details will be in my description. Otherwise, unsubscribe from my channel and goodbye.